O'Connor. I'm, I'm the Deputy Director at the National Aging Research Institute. So I'd very much like to welcome you to our seminars on aging. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting today. For me, that's the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and waters across Australia. And I pay my respects to elders past and present and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, including members of the Stolen Generations, particularly at this period of Australian history. Um, firstly, a little housekeeping. Um, at the conclusion of the talk, uh, we'll have some time for Q&A, I hope, and you'll be able to submit questions throughout the um, presentation using the chat function, um, which can be opened in the chat tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, today's seminar will be videoed and, um, uh, and recorded and uploaded to our website within a few days. So please keep in mind, um, keep this in mind. Um, if you turn on your screen or video to ask the question that your image will be included in the recording. Um, so today it's, it's my great pleasure to introduce um, Professor Laurie Byers, um, who will probably be known to many of you on, on this um, Zoom. Um, Laurie is based in Queensland and is Professor of Healthy Aging, Faculty of Health Sciences at the Australian Catholic University. Um, she focuses on and facilitates partnerships between industry, government, researchers uh, to address the complex challenges and opportunities resulting from longevity and healthy ageing. Um, she is the past president of the uh, Australian Association of Gerontology and has had a very long association with that group. Today she'll be presenting longevity, the alternative perspective and impact of ageing. So very much welcoming you, Laurie, and handing over to you. Thanks, Deborah, and thanks so much for having me. I'm really, really pleased. It'd be lovely to be in Melbourne, but um, <laughs> I'll suffer with, um, with um, the lovely warm Brisbane at the moment. <laughs> um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet. And today I'm at the Jagger and Turbo people. Um, land, so we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. So today, who are we going to be talking about in terms of longevity? Well, we're going to be talking about you. We're going to be talking about me and we're going to be talking about all of us. Um, it, it, I think a lot of the conversations that we have around longevity or healthy aging, a lot of it is around othering. We talk about the other people and those those older people but today actually let's just talk about you and me and us um we know that the world is constantly changing so back in 1998 those of you who remember back then there was not a lot of people online and google was just being born and having a mobile phone was pretty cool so now most people use the internet google is a verb and almost everybody has a has a smartphone so the things Within a short period of time, things have really dramatically changed. And I think it's fair to say that in the future, it's going to change even quicker. But let's just have a look at our demographics. So life expectancy in 1909 was 53. And we set the, pe the pension age at 65. And there was 300,000 people over 65. So then we move all, all the way up to 2023. And there's life expectancy is 83. We have 4.2 million people over 65. And our pension age is still 67. It hasn't really changed that much from 65. So if we had the same, the same age range as in 1909, the pension age would actually be 95 now. So what's been interesting is that what's where we're going to head. So pretty soon, there's going to be a lot more of us who are over 65, and I wonder what the pension age is. So we actually have a 30-year longevity bonus, and we have it right now, and we have it for a lot of people. So it's that 30 extra years that are past 65 that we hadn't really thought about back in all through the years. We actually didn't see longevity coming. And we certainly haven't planned for it. So what is longevity? Longevity is living, learning, working, and playing all your life. It's about that the journey that we take throughout our life. And it's about live, learn, work, and play. 
So, but if we look through the lens of longevity, how do we actually best leverage those extra 30 years of life? And that's a real question. It's something that we have to think about all of us. How do we, how do we leverage our life, but also how do we increase and leverage the best extra 30 years of other people's lives? But we didn't see longevity coming. We didn't see it at all. So I guess, why are we here? Why are we here still talking about um, negative aspects of the aging of population? So what happened? Why did that happen? What's really interesting that even right now, we actually talk about the age dependency ratio. I saw that in the media the other day. And the age dependency ratio is the, work, the, working age, the, the working age people who support those who are non-working age. So it's the burden of working age persons in order to provide for non-working age persons. So what's interesting about this one is that even today we talk about 15 year olds going out to work full time, which we know is probably not true given that they're in school until much later. And it also assumes that at 65, you stop working. So this definition that we're working on assumes that no one over 65 works, people at 65 plus are a burden, and that people 65 plus need to be cared for. Those are the assumption that underlines the, the, um, that, that particular assumption. So it makes the assumption that people over 65 are dependent. And that's the assumption that we start with within government policy, economics, things that we do in Australia, but also externally, which is a very interesting position to start with. So that means that basically how we view, how we view people. So children are dependent, but they're our future. And we set up a whole lot of different infrastructure that we put around children. We put schools and playgrounds and sporting fields and all sorts of things to help children grow. Then we've got the productive members of society who are 60, 15 to 64 year olds. And there's also a lot of infrastructure that we put around. We put in roads and buildings and transport and all sorts of things to enable people to, to work. Then we have our 65 year olds who are dependent, but they're not our future. When was the last time you actually ever heard someone say, that 75 year old, they're the future of Australia. It's interesting, we just don't say it, do we? Do we say someone who's 60 is the future of Australia? So what infrastructure do we actually build for people who are 60, 65 and above? We build aged care, we build retirement villages, and we might have a little bit of U3A, but what else do we do? What infrastructure do we actually put in place to keep people particularly engaged. So where are we actually, um, the, the early theories of aging, I think we might wanna just take a quick look at those. You guys will all be very, very familiar with them. Um, disengagement was, was very prominent and that was withdrawing from meaningful roles in society. And the reason I highlighted that was because I'm not so sure we've actually moved away from that. So then we have the activity theory, and that was people maintained activity and then continuity theory as well. And then we moved on to the aging theories of successful aging, which had a health and medical focus, productive aging, which wasn't particularly popular, if you remember back in the day, active aging, which put health out the front, supported by participation in security. And now at the WHO, we're on to healthy aging, which has a health and wellness focus. But again, it's around care, health, and medical. But let's take another look at disengagement theory. So according to disengagement theory, aging is an inevitable mutual withdrawal or disengagement resulting in a decreased interaction between the aging person and others in the social system he belongs to, which clearly is an older one from 1961. But basically the premise is it is natural and acceptable for older people to withdraw from society. So just keep that in mind as we, as we walk through. So it's 65, that's a birthday that should be celebrated, but it's actually 
deemed as a retirement day. It's like, when are you retirement? That's your retirement day. It's there's a lot of expectations that actually occur on that birthday. So base, so the day before you are a productive member of society, the day of your birthday, you would then become a dependent member of society. And we actually prepare people to become dependent. This was an advertisement I got from my bank and I was getting, I get those every so often because I'm in my 60s now. So I get this all the time. So what will Eleanor, Eleanor is actually my first name. Um, what will Eleanor time look like in retirement? Well, plan for me time. First of all, I've never played a game of golf in my life. But again, people think that that's, that's what you do at retirement. So what will Eleanor time look like in retirement? Uni Super sent me a, a webinar to go for age care. So um, to find out about age care, and I wrote to them and I said, well, what about working longer? And she said, unfortunately, Uni Super doesn't have webinars that specifically relate to working longer and making the most out of your super. However, our retirement considerations webcast discusses it benefits of investing over the long time, no matter when you work. But this is the real kicker. Most insurers cease income protection benefits at age 65. The rationale is that by this stage, people have built up a significant level of assets, paid off debt, and are not supporting children. That was written to me back in April. So if you're 65 and you're in a superannuation, you no longer have income protection because of the assumptions that they make that you can self-insure. And those of you who are out there who are researchers, we know the situation for a lot of women over 50. So it's very interesting of the, <laughs> the messaging that we're getting. So aged care is, or aging is all about health and medical. There's a lot of imagery. There's a lot of conversations about health and medical. Like I said, from Uni Super, they were inviting me to come to an aged care webinar. Um, there's also a lot around care. Um, if the, the moment um, you talk about healthy aging, a lot of people go to dementia and they go straight to care regardless of everyone 65 plus. So if we have a look at theories and if you look at um, symbolic interactionism, if you take it from a, a society perspective is that we actually develop our identities through social interactions and situations with others. And we modify our identity as interactions with others change. So as you go through life and then you hit your 50s and 60s and you start to get the dripping tap about when are you retiring? When are you gonna stop doing things? When are you going to play golf? When are you going to do that? All of that starts to create how we feel about ourselves and we start to drink the Kool-Aid. There's also around affordance theory that actually says that the world is perceived not only by in terms of the shapes and relationships, but also about opportunities for action that are provided. So it's not only what people say to us and how they interact with us, but it's actually how we see the world and the opportunities that are there within the world. So for example, these visual clues give us an indication of what we can or cannot do in a place. So we know on this pathway, you're allowed to follow that pathway. You can sit down and it's kind of clear that it's inviting you to use that space. So the environment impacts our identity and our interaction. So let's just take a little look here. So when we talk about retirement, and there's a, a fair bit of I read in articles that are sent to me to review and, the, and also in grants, it's all around retirement. Well, the, the, the traditional meaning of retirement is actually withdrawing or leaving, which is absolutely directly in line with disengagement theory. So if we start to layer what I said before, you've got disengagement theory, you've got talking about retirement, then it's actually about planning for retirement, planning for withdrawing, planning for playing golf. Then we actually build a lot of the, our senior infrastructure 
that is other retirement villages or aged care or over 50s villages. And a lot of them actually have walls that are all around them. So it's around the signal that you need to be protected within or we need to keep you out. So one of the two is keep people out or keep people in. But it's to keep people safe because people need to be kept safe for, for whatever reason. Now, this is a, an innovation in retirement living. I chose one from Canada so that um, those of us in Australia, but you would, you would see the same design in, in Australia. Um, that is a, a five-star um, retirement village. There's a, a, a wonderful restaurant that's, that's right down below. There's a cafe. There's um, a fire pit in the middle, and it has a duck pond, and it has a whole range of things. But the innovation is that, that walkway that goes between that goes to something else into the into the distance so you've got the retirement village and then you've got the walkway now what the walkway goes to will tell you through the affordance theory clearly what is expected from you so if there is a university at the other end of that then that will tell you that it's that they're actually hoping that you'll go to university, you'll, be, you'll participate in the university, you'll either work there, you'll be a student there or so forth. Then, or if there's a business or a shopping mall or so forth. But what's actually on the other side of that, that walkway is in fact a hospital. So it actually tells you that the waiting, that the waiting room is actually the, the restaurant and that you're looking across to that hospital and there's a bridge that takes you to the hospital, that that's where you're heading. So they might as well just build another bridge to the crematorium and be done with it. So this is also a, a five-star aged care facility and on, on first blush, it looks like it's wonderful, a great place to end, you know, like you spend time and, you know, when you're, when you're frail. But if you have a look around at this, it's a great place to have holidays, but it's actually a very controlled place. You're not allowed to have anything that's unique to yourself. You're not allowed to do any gardening. You're not allowed to leave anything. If you left a towel, can you imagine? So again, we're, we're controlling all of our spaces and making everything so tight down so there's not a lot of space to move or to, to create or be, be you, live, learn, work and play. You actually need to conform to your environment. So again, it's around older people, withdraw them, keep them tight and then, and then off you go. So what do people talk about? So we, when I was at QUT, we did some scraping of, um, of the social media and we came up with this is what the industry is actually talking about. And so we did an online community and we also looked at what people, 100 people aged 50 to 54, we looked to see what they talked about. So what we found that they talked about is they talked about the importance of occupation. People talked about the value of wanting to have meaning and purpose in their lives. They wanted to have it paid, pro bono, or volunteering, but again, it was meaning and purpose. They wanted a work-life balance, and that was all the way up through to your 90-year-olds. It wanted work-life balance, so that balance between work and play. And then a holiday was that, just that. It's a holiday. It's nothing more than a holiday, and a holiday lasts for a week or two. It doesn't last 30 years. They also wanted valued and reciprocal relationships, reciprocity. So you give to me and I give back to you. They didn't want it to be a one-way street, which is what often care can be. I care for you and you receive my care, but there's no reciprocity. And most people wanted to live in a multi-generational community, except for about 3% of them. Um, the rest wanted to live in multi-generational, multicultural, vibrant communities for their whole life. But the main thing is for us to remember is everybody wants that work-life balance throughout their life, meaning and purpose with leisure. So what do older adults talk about? This is what people talked about. They talked about life, love, connecting, living, doing things. But really, what do we as an industry talk about? We talk about care, medical, Alzheimer's and dementia and all those sorts of things. So again, 
there's a disconnect between living and actually what we what we're talking about. So I wonder if we might want to change our mindset around aging and move it from the old mindset of aging as a deterioration to more about longevity. So what's really interesting, and I put this slide up, is that a lot of the conversations I see, not only in the media, but as I said, of the grants that I'm reading, aging, an aging population is actually, is actually described as a problem. The problem is so many people are living longer. But what's interesting is that we put a lot of money into medical research and health research to increase the long times that we lived. And then all of a sudden it's become a problem. So as, as we as researchers and academics and as policy people, if we continue to actually describe the aging of the population as a problem or a challenge, we miss the whole narrative of actually how do we leverage or um, use it as an opportunity. So we miss that whole opportunity dialogue narrative by framing everything as an aging population problem. So I guess my challenge is also to say to you, think about it when you're when you're actually positioning your problem or the, the, the issue that you're trying to solve. Is it really the aging of the population that's a problem? Because that's actually, it's actually an opportunity. So why should you care? Because if we talk about it's me time or let me care for you or it's time to relax or, you know, these people or this and that and the other or we other, it actually translates to you are no longer capable or productive and you know are no longer of value. So those are the messages that we actually send to people through that dripping tap that comes through what we do in our messaging. So the question we have to ask ourselves, are we creating and facilitating burden? Are we the ones that are doing it? Are we the ones that are saying that it's time to, to retire or, you know, aged care, a building in the way we deliver our services? Or are we, do we need to actually say, how do we actually facilitate people to engage? So we did not see longevity coming. We did not see the narrative that needed to change around people who are 60, 65, 70, 75, 80. So if we have longevity, if we come from a longevity mindset, we actually start to assume capacity and we assume value. So it means that actually, if people stay in productive and meaningful roles, they will stay in their homes longer, they will maintain health and well-being, spend money, contribute to the economy. Those of us in our 60s continue to be engaged. We want to buy products and services and we actually contribute to society. So if you come from a longevity perspective, you actually facilitate capacity and value. We know that health is getting better. That's why we want to do this. People are going to be living longer and they are living longer in better health. So why aren't we leveraging that? Um, you know, why aren't we building on and, and uh, leveraging our opportunities? We also know that employment is increasing. So we know that people are staying in the workforce longer. So why aren't we building infrastructure and providing people with the, the incentives and the ability to continue working? So it becomes a choice because not everyone can finish work at 65. Um, not everyone wants to finish work at 65. So why aren't we opening up those, those opportunities? So we know that age is just a number. It's nothing else. Age doesn't tell you exactly where you are in this life. There's also intergenerational changes. Future generations of older people will be very different than the current generation of older people. And if we keep approaching everything from an, um, an aging mindset, we're going to miss the opportunities. And people arrive at 65 with a history. They arrive with varying physical and social economic culture experiences which impact on their journey. But again, if you come from a, a strength-based perspective, you can average leverage what you've got. And lifestyles, expectations, capacity, opportunities and constraints are constantly changing. And we have to remember that. As we, as we work through um, 
the, the work we do and how we approach people, we have to remember it's a dynamic situation. So I challenge you to, to blow up your assumptions. You know, blow up that assumption that we the age dependency ratio changed that. What happens if we actually move it from everyone from 18 to 75? That actually changes the age dependency ratio overnight. So again, there's a ways of, and we should blow up those assumptions that people become a burden straight away. So we have that opportunity. The opportunity really is to change our mindset. It's to change it from a, the closed mindset of aging to the open mindset of longevity. So the aging mindset, the traditional one is that you peak around 40 and it's downhill all the all the way. And then, you know, you're starting to lose all the different, um, I guess, value that you've got. But the longevity mindset is that you continue to adding value all throughout your life and that you build and you actually continue to grow. Um, there's a saying that people don't grow old. When they stop growing, they become old. And that was a, a, a saying that Tilda Day's art, she was the, the cyber granny and she came from Germany, moved to Australia, had a, had a career in um, newspaper and doing various things. And when she was 60, she decided that she wanted to become a social worker. So Hilda was in, had a number of mobility issues and health issues. So she became a social worker at 60 and she had a 25 year career. So again, she used what her, the benefits that she had, she used her um, assets and she put them to work and actually continued growing up until the day she died and influenced a lot of people along the way. So she, so she certainly had that longevity mindset and never ever and always challenged everyone against having that aging mindset. So we need to change the current mindset to one of growth and opportunities and actually believing people have that ability to continue learning, to change their career when they're at whatever age they want, to have a new exciting adventure, whatever that might be. It's about creating options to live, learn, work and play throughout your whole life. So just as a thought, we might wanna change our approach from health and care to actually participation and support, because you can actually have health and care underpinning participation and support with participation being the outcome that we're trying to achieve. So keeping people engaged is the outcome. They're supported through health care support um, and wellness and so forth, but the end game needs to be meaning and purpose and engagement. So the new older consumer is going to be you and me and all of us. We're going, we're going to be the next generation of consumers. We're going to be the next generation of older people, and some of us are already there. So if we embrace longevity, it actually has economic, social, environmental benefits for Australia, for all of us individually and as a collective. So by actually embracing what we what we can and actually maintaining that it means we have a much happier healthier life over time so thank you very much and i will pause there thank you laurie um, and judging by the responses in the chat there's a lot of excitement and um, uh, enthusiasm about your presentation today and what it could mean um, going forward so um, I'm just look, having a look at the chat um, as we're talking and um, quite a number are suggesting that this needs to go a lot further and your thinking needs to go a lot further. Um, but I think uh, there's a question from Chris Tullock, um, are we creating an, and facilitating burden? Um, she or he, I'm not sure are asking is, is this a very important point? Does Chris like? Yes, to... yes I'm here, my, my pronouns are she, her. Thank you for, for clarifying. Um, I, it was, I was reiterating something that, um, that Dr. Byers said. Uh, so that's not my point. It was more that Laurie had said, are we creating and facilitating burden? And I was just emphasizing that I found that to be um, such an important point that I think sometimes we lose sight of it. 
but it, it wasn't really a question, but thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you. In fact, I had been thinking similar lines, really. There's a paradox there, isn't there, by highlighting burden, and I, I, I can't see a way around it. I just wondered if you've got any thoughts about that, Laurie. It, it is a really interesting... Um, and I've given a lot of thought to, to this, and it's... And having been in, in the ageing area for a very long time, and it's it's around what we what we lead with and if we lead with older people are a problem that's what people hear immediately and it then becomes a problem to solve um and it's a, a problem to solve is older people and i guess maybe because i'm now one of those people that is the problem to solve i kind of feel about like well actually i'm pretty sure there's a lot more um to give than to than to to solve the problem, and I was and it really has struck me that if we st and I was reviewing some grants and nationally and internationally, everyone leads with this is the problem. Older people are the problem. They are the burden. They're the ones that are actually doing all these things, as opposed to actually talking about what are the opportunities that people that people bring. What are um, what do they what do they give what do they and how do we actually support that so leading with the problem all the time it's that's what people hear and that's what people react to so again I think we as particularly as those of us who are in research and, and, and in policy we actually need to lead with actually we've got these amazing assets so can you imagine telling children you guys are the problem because you guys are at school and we have to pay for you all the time. Like, you just wouldn't do it, would you? You know, if you put it in a different context, it really becomes like, wow, actually we need to lead with the, the benefits and we need to support you to do, to, to, to do your good stuff. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a question from David, I think, or a comment from David Sykes that um, I think is uh, interested in exploring a bit more. And, there's great presentation to how much uh, and how much do health professionals actually reinforce this, perhaps unintentionally because of how they are trained. Any comments or response to that? And David, I'm sorry if you want to elaborate on that question. Can't see you. Uh, I think you've captured it, Deborah. Um, yeah, just uh, I'm just conscious that uh, you know with as health professionals are often trained to, as you said before, Laurie help people with problems. <laughs> We're sort of problem solvers and focused on the problem that needs to be fixed. Um, and um, that's often built around uh, um, models of unwellness and illness and frailty and all of those things that that uh, um, then the training kind of reinforces that. And so I think what you presented today um, potentially health professionals and the very work they do uh, really reinforces that that thinking, I guess. It's interesting, David, because um, when you are a certain age, it's amazing what how people view you. Um, my mother in law had a heart condition, and when I went with her to the nurse practitioner, the nurse practitioner said her husband had the same had the same condition that she did. And I said, oh, uh, what, what treatment is he getting for it? And it was exercise and the various things. And I said, oh, well, will she be getting that too? And will she be doing exercise? And she said, what, at 85? And I'm like, mm, yeah, at 85. And she said, oh, darling, your daughter-in-law doesn't know how ill and sick you are, that you need to sit down and rest. And what happened? <laughs> yeah. Mm, I think there's a lot of messages there. And I notice there's a plethora of hands have sprung up, and I'm not sure in what order they've come, but I'll take the first I can see, which is Bryony. Jao from Nari. Hi, Laurie. Great to see you, and thanks so much for your presentation. Um, um, you're certainly speaking to the converted here, so <laughs> good to hear. But I was interested in your comment, actually, about the uh, dependency ratios, and I agree with all your critique of that. But uh, I know there's been some interesting work done by CPAR and, and others 
that actually show that if you think about where the taxpayer dollars is being spent, it's being spent increasingly on younger generations rather than older generations. There's a shift actually um, in terms of tax uh, deficit, if you like, because younger people, as you mentioned, are, are, are staying at school, are, you know, staying learning longer. They're tending to live at home for longer. Older people are working for longer and supporting their children. And then you said, let's wonder what it would look like if we made it, if we shifted it to 75. Do you know if anyone's done that? Because I thought, yeah, that's actually a really good idea. <laughs> I haven't seen that though. Yeah, I have worked with a, a few economists um, in my time where we, we play with it and look to see. And and there is there are a few that will say you can actually solve that problem just by moving the age moving the bucket. Age. And, yeah. and it's not a problem anymore. And it literally isn't a problem because these people are working and productive and doing things anyway. Um, but again, it, it's it's not taken up. And that's that's the challenge. And same with the, the CPAR. It's not embedded in the the everyday language of, you know, of, of Canberra and of yeah. various places. And that's what we need to do as a collective. We need to start saying, actually, let's get the facts right. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Thanks. It's interesting, though, what's happened with in France when they've tried to reduce or uh, um, increase the age limit, and whether that's an indicator of some of the um, the backlash that there might be. I'm not sure how to how to interpret that in this in this conversation, though. Deborah, I mean, that's a really good comment. We've been I've been tossing that around, and I think it's around having the choice. Um, it's around, there are, you know, it's 65 and there are a number of people with occupations that would struggle to continue working in that occupation. But if you actually create a different pipeline through in a different way through and create opportunities to, to either continue your education or continue your training, but also opportunities to stay if you, if you choose, it's not actually saying people have to continue to work. I don't think we want to do that. Because you can retire at 30 if you want to, but it's about creating those opportunities that people have the opportunities to, to live their life like they want to. Yes, thank you. Um, Rhonda, Rhonda Day, there's a hand up. Rhonda? Thanks. Um, I missed the first part of this, sorry, but I was at yoga, and I'm a, one of the much older people than you, Laurie. Um, but um, I wanted to say that not all people find meaning and purpose in work. In fact, many of them don't. And so the time after work is more often an opportunity for them to find that. I mean, we're very lucky. The people on this screen generally have jobs that are you know, rewarding, interesting, um, challenging. We're doing something good for the community. But, you know, I also worked in a factory when I was a student and it wasn't like that. So um, I think that we need some research on the things that people do after they leave work that give them meaning and purpose and that contribute to society because we don't value the 54, I think it was 54 billion a year that people put in in volunteer work or the work in mining their grandchildren. Um, all of those things that actually contribute to the economy but are not included in the GDP. So I, I think oh, that's where the research ought to be. Stories should come from it. And look, I couldn't agree with you more. I, and if you look at the, the words I use are occupation. Mm. Um, and occupation can take a whole range of, of opportunities. It can be, and meaning and purpose doesn't necessarily mean paid work. It actually is around having meaning and purpose in your life. It's actually having a reason to get out of bed and to do things. And that, that's what we need to have options and choices so that if you do want to have paid work, you can. Or if you want to do promo, then you can or volunteering. Or if you want to do your sport or you want to various things. But it's about actually having the, the choice and being enabled to have meaning and purpose in your life. Thank you. I think this um, presentation is a real conversation starter too. So I would urge people to share the presentation when it's online, if Laurie's okay, mm -hmm. um, with their colleagues and perhaps have some conversations in the staff room around this. Um, Bianca. 
Thanks, Laurie. That was a terrific talk and, and so thought provoking. Um, I'd like to uh, take you back a bit to the uh, to get your reflections on the kind of politics um, around uh, increasing the retirement age and perhaps, um, you know, on the one hand, what do you think, you know, politicians are very frightened every time there's a discussion around increasing retirement ages, you know, it, it doesn't watch well with, with the public. Um, so I guess reflections on that. And then reflections maybe on um, why it is, given that older people are an increasing voter base, that we continue to position older people as a burden, as, you know, needing, um, uh, as, as being the problem. Yeah, I think that there's a lot in there, Bianca. Thanks. <laughs> um, there is a lot of politics around the, the retirement age. I think that where I'd like to see the conversation going is around empowering people to have other options um, so that you don't necessarily have to retire. Um, for example, like not to have the dripping tap starting at 50, like every quarter getting the, when are you going to retire? Are you ready to retire? So it's, it's actually promoting that ability. And there's a lot of ageism that goes in that, but again, we that's been going on for a long time. So we have to have a different approach as to how we do it. And I noticed someone in the, in the chat said it's the economics and absolutely that's, that's the conversation we need to have. It's about not necessarily changing the retirement or the pension age, but it's actually changing the word retirement to something different. It's which is all around what is the next chapter of your life? What does it look like? What do you want to? What do you want to do? How do you want to engage? You've got if you're um, 65, you've got another 20 years. You got to figure out what you're going to do with that. That's meaning and it has meaning for you. What do you? It does. You know, it can be a whole host of things. I forgot what the, the other bit was. You asked me, sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. Um, the other bit was I, I was asking you to reflect that um, given that older people are now an increasing voter base, um, you know, because the, the population itself is growing, um, perhaps to reflect on why is it that governments, irrespective of their political persuasion, continue to frame older people as the problem? And I think, Bianca, that's a really great question that we should probably push up to them and say, why, why are you doing this? Because I suspect baby boomers are going to start to get a little bit um, not happy with that. Um, so I think that's a great question that, again, as a collective, as, as an industry in our sector, we, could, we, should, we should push up to those guys. So absolutely. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, Francis. Bachelor. Oh, hi. Hi, Laurie. Thanks. Oh, I'm just technolo technology challenge today. I was trying to turn on my camera. But anyway, you can hear me. So that's okay. Um, I was just going to pick up on your point about uh, also relating to what you just said about um, baby boomers. I hear I can click on my camera now. It should start to work. Um, and I often hear in the media, oh, things are going to change because the baby boomers are coming through and they're going to have different demands than what older people before them have had. And I just wonder if that's really going to be the case. I think we like to think that's going to be the case because we want to have agency. But we've all had experiences even, you know, in our younger selves of having hospital care where we've felt disempowered and things like that and I'm, I'm just wondering what your reflections on that sort of shift might be. Yeah look I think Francis if you had the answer to that you would <laughs> you would make a lot of money. Um, I'm guessing there will be changes I'm you know I have also heard that that and you're right the there are things that go Forward, but I've also seen a lot of changes in terms of um, how people, just even in the shops when the invisibility cloak comes on, people are standing up for not being invisible. Um, there's a lot of, if you just even, we've been going to the, the football, those of you who are watching the World Cup, and, and really to see that intergenerational, a lot of older people are going to the games people way up into their 80s and, you know, and they're, people are really engaging. And so 
I'm guessing that things will change. And I'm pretty sure that there's a lot of aged care providers who know that that's going to change, that they're going to have to step up some of the things that they're doing and preparing. So I think it would be unwise to assume that baby boomers are going to stay the same as they always have, because there's a lot more people speaking out and just not putting up with being called sweetie and darling. So I, yeah, I, it would be a brave person to ignore that. Person. Well, I hope, I hope that's the case. <laughs> mm. um, there are a couple more questions coming through, but I'm also conscious that um, David Williams, you had a question in your chat. Did you want to expand on that or do a response to, there are two, you said uh, you- I wouldn't you, mind expanding on it a bit. Okay. Do you want to go? Okay, thank you. Hi, hi Laurie. Terrific presentation. Thank you. Uh, summed it up beautifully. Uh, I see there are two major issues. Um, by the way, we've had over a quarter of a million people going through our website trying to understand more about their longevity. And we know there's a, an enormous wish to have more information that frames their future for them, not just as some cipher, which is the biggest problem we're facing. So we really need to help people and educate people. And I think this is a problem for all the institutes and all the researchers that have massive amounts of information to get together and build a proper longevity education process that anyone can see. And I'm starting to advocate the super funds should be doing this well before people get to 65, not just at 65 because there's a financial change that might take place. So we really have to do a lot more for the individuals to help them understand themselves and plot their future and then frame their financial decisions and those sorts of things within that concept of a future. And we all know what the life expectancies are doing. The other thing, though, is that we have a lot of government areas, silos, I call them, that are dealing with parts of longevity. They're dealing with super and tax. They're dealing with social security. They're dealing with employment and what and ageism. They're dealing with health and they're dealing with aged care. And they could all be utilised collectively if we had a much more cohesive longevity strategy nationally so that we can incentivize <clears throat> people as well as simply aim to support them as they become more doddery and get older. We need to encourage people to see that longevity is the rest of their life and the retirement is an archaic concept developed 120 years ago or 130 years ago to get older people out of work so younger people would have jobs in, in Germany and wouldn't be such a problem. And so everything we're doing is framed by things that are 120, 130 years old and we haven't had the wit or the encouragement or whatever it is, and perhaps not a big enough voice than we have now, to actually vocalise what the issues are and the relatively simple ways we can address them. Thanks, David. Laurie, would you like to respond to David? I'm sorry, David, I didn't get you to introduce yourself when you're talking about your website. Oh, yes, sorry. Uh, I didn't want to promote particularly, but we have a website we started 15 years ago called mylongevity.com.au where people can go to get a rough idea of how long they might live using the AHW, AHW data to see what the stages might look like and the dependency gets less as you get older, the period of dependency not more, which is one of the most misunderstood concepts. So we're, we're trying to help people understand themselves and increasingly now to get at organisations, financial planners, super funds, particularly at the moment, to take more of an active role in preparing people for the rest of their life, not just in, in sort of babying them along. It's out of date. Uh, thanks, David. Laurie, did you want to respond or add to that? Oh, not really. I think um, I agree. Okay. <laughs> <It's>, um, <laughs> coming a from a longevity perspective has definitely got to be a benefit Australia. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Maria. Oh, hi, Laurie. Good afternoon. And thank you so much for that lovely presentation. Um, I work in aged care. Um, 
I just want to ask if you have any thoughts about, um, you know, um, the people living in aged care, how can we promote um, the program of being um, not feeling like a burden to other people because they're already in care? Is there anything that we could do in aged care that hopefully, and I would say if we could do that, it might take away some of the depression and anxiety that they are feeling, you know, as part of aging probably. You have any thoughts about that? Oh, Maria, I have a lot of thoughts about that. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure everybody here, I know a lot of my colleagues, we've talked about this for, for a long time. And uh, I, I guess if we, if we think about aged care and actually came to and really kind of changed it from a place where you go to just, just get care. And, and it's not just, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's a lot of it's been mandated down through um, the, the act and the legislation and all, and it's basically, it's come from a variety of different perspectives. And so if you're trying to be compliant, basically what you're doing is you're providing care and it's a one direction of care. Um, and as we move into the new regulations, it, some will be good, some will be bad, but, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is all around that basic level of care. There's very little in there around living and actually engaging and contributing and, and, and I guess being part of life. And so I think we would probably, we, as a, and that's what we need to do as a group is really challenge that aged care should be age support. And it should be around how do we, what comes first is your engagement. There should be some discussions about um, the ability to have risk, even when you're frail, mm -hmm. um, the ability to try and and do things. And it's all around not protecting people, but allowing them to experience a full gamut of emotions, mm -hmm. uh, allowing people to be part of life, allowing people to you know, maybe make some of their meals and do some of their things and, and engage. Mm -hmm. um, I have a colleague here at ACU who wants to do a whole project called Parkour for Aged Care. So, because um, his view is that the aged care environment has been made so easy and so mm -hmm. straightforward and that environment that you, you lose your eye-hand coordination because you don't have to be pay attention to your environment because it's such mm -hmm. an easy environment to work for, walk mm -hmm. through so that you will fall if you walk outside of the, the institution. So um, he wants to do parkour for aged care. And so I reckon we start doing some of those kinds of things or bushwalking or yeah. various things that get you out in that environment in which you yeah. have to use your brain and move around. So I think there's a lot of things we can do, but we're going to have to do it together because mm -hmm. um, the first word that comes out of everyone's mouth is risk. And I guess I just want to know, I guess the question we have to ask back is, well, when do, when is it okay for someone to take my ability to have risk out of my life? Mm, so true. I think we have to empower people to have risk, mm. you know, but, you know, and to make choices. So I think there's a lot we can do there, Maria, a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of ideas there, but thank you so much for all your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. That I think that risk question is really interesting. I know my colleague, Professor Joanna Saskiewicz, is very interested in the dignity of risk, um, but I won't, we haven't got time to go there at the moment. But there is, Rosalie, I liked your comments in the chat, and um, it's your turn for a question, and probably the last question at this point, I think. Thanks, Deborah, and uh, thanks, Laurie. Um, absolutely brilliant presentation. So um, it was music to my ears. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I manage aged care uh, in in rural Victoria, and I'm I think I'm a thorn in the Commonwealth side because what they're actually moving from a psychosocial model of care to a medical health model, and because we're actually working in the community, the model that they're proposing is actually aligning with residential and I keep telling the Commonwealth we are not a residential setting we are a guest in the client's home and mm. some of the checks and balances that they're wanting us to do I'm saying it's impossible mm. well, and why should we do that when it's the client again it's around the dignity of risk it's around their choice they don't want to be treated as though they're in a residential setting they're yeah. in their home so um, as I say, it would be great if collectively, I'm not, uh, the, many of us are sort of up talking about this, all of the categories that they're trying to get their head around um, are really ramping up. 
the need for medicalising uh, these services. And they don't need to be. These clients may need assistance with showering or assistance with some aspects of their um, cleaning of their homes, but they don't need a full... Um, they don't need a full medical assessment, but they're getting it. They don't need full medical, uh, you know, services. They just want to live in their homes with a little bit of extra support. And all of a sudden, the Commonwealth is are trying to work out how the hell they pay for this now because they can't afford it. Um, and it, it's a real concern. So it's probably not a question of building on from that comment, but it really... Um, it alarms the hell out of me of what the Commonwealth is doing at the moment. Yeah, I have a feeling today is the start of a lot of conversations. Um, and um, I think what you've done today, Laurie, has really helped us frame some of those conversations and contribute to them. So it's been fantastic. Um, so I'd really like to thank you for your presentation and ask people to respond with their clap reactions, which is the Zoom audience response and, and it was a fantastic um, uh, discussion session as well and we'll capture some of that. Um, so my um, final comments are just to uh, um, alert you to the next um, seminar on ageing, which will be also um, uh, somebody from Queensland, QUT, Professor um, Patsy Yates, who am who are presenting on strengthening palliative care services for older people. Again, I think a, a really topical and very interesting um, presentation. So I hope you can join us, which was Tuesday the 12th. But I'm going to take a facilitator's prerogative and promote two things that events that will be happening at NARI in the next month or so. Um, and one is the NARI Summit on the 15th of the 9th um, of September. Uh, menopause and beyond promoting older women's health and well-being, um, which will be held as a face-to-face -face in Melbourne. Um, but uh, most of you hopefully are on the mailing list. If you're not, please join us and we'll give you more information. And also um, the Melbourne Aging Research Collaboration Symposium, Aging in a Changing Ecosystem from Micro to Macro Perspectives, which I think very much aligns with the response with the um, presentation from Laurie today. So I think it's just um to thank you all for being here and look forward to seeing you all at our next seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Laurie.